unity, which is theology. Shaw's book, Attack of the Theocrats, uh, with its wonderful plan for the future, I commend to you as a manifesto for our movement. So please get Shaw's book. I, before coming here, I uh, was at the NBC studio in Washington, taking part in a live television broadcast. And it, it proved to be a very interesting discussion uh, involving uh, Steven Pinker, among others, uh, Susan Jacoby, uh, various other, other people. And uh, I decided that I would um, discard the prepared talk that I was going to give with a keynote presentation, um, and that I would talk about issues that arose out of that because it was such an interesting thing. But the most interesting thing that happened in this morning's broadcast came right at the end, and I want to uh, call your attention to that first. We in the Richard Dawkins Foundation are very proud of our association with the Clergy Project. The Clergy Project, as many of you may know, is a project to encourage and embolden those many clergymen and women who have lost their faith and are on the verge of coming out to their congregations, to their families, uh, which is a highly difficult and courageous thing to do. Uh, it's one thing for all of us in here to come out as atheists or free thinkers uh, and perhaps upset families, perhaps upset friends. But imagine you're in the position of somebody who has spent your life as a clergyman or woman, whose entire career, whose livelihood, social circle, everything about your life depends upon, is identified with the fact that you are a member of the clergy. It takes real courage to recognize the truth about the universe which you have discovered by looking at the evidence and to come out. And at the end of the NBC broadcast this morning, one of our Clergy Project members publicly came out as a non-believer. Maybe others will soon follow. Uh, so I would like to ask Pastor Mike Aus to stand up and be honoured by this crowd. Mike, are you here? disrespect for individuals 
and showing disrespect for what they believe. Uh, I don't think it's obvious that we should regard a person's, particularly politicians, private religious beliefs as somehow off limits. There is in this country a culture which it's, it, it's, I think is easily confusable with the very laudable separation between church and state. There's a culture that says that a politician, for example, is entitled to private religious beliefs which should not be on the table, which should not be debated, which should not be questioned in public debates. And I think I may be in a minority even in this hall on this question because the, it does run very deep in American culture that religion is a private matter which should not be on the table in public debate unless it's actually deliberately put on the table by the believer himself. Suppose we take a voter who is deciding who to vote for and you look at the publicly stated policies of the candidates that you're offered and you look at their taxation policy, their military policy, their economic policy and so on and all that's public and that's absolutely accepted that that's what we should talk about. But suppose you know that privately it's been made publicly available but their private belief is something utterly ridiculous equivalent to believing that you are Napoleon. <laughs> Suppose that the person that you're thinking of voting for believes that a 19th century man dug up some golden tablets <laughs> some unknown language which he was able to translate with the aid of a magic stone in a hat. <laughs> a 19th century man who with the aid of the magic stone translated not into 19th century English but into 16th century English. What's that about? <laughs> And you're faced with voting for somebody who, whether or not you like his taxation policy, his monetary policy, his business policy, anything else, believes that story about the magic stone in a top hat. Do you want to entrust your country to a man who is capable of holding a totally ridiculous belief? Or is it private business, nothing to do with us? Is it private and therefore should not be on the table, should not be asked? Suppose his rival for the nomination of his party. <laughs> believes that when a priest blesses a wafer, it literally turns into the body of a first century Jew. <laughs> <laughs> literally believes, literally believes that wine turns into the blood of that same possibly existent individual. <laughs> Whether or not you support the policies of this candidate, do you want to entrust the governance of your country to somebody who's capable of believing something so absolutely mad, crazy, bonkers? <laughs> Or is it a private matter that we have no business uh, inquiring into? Now, the most articulate and most praiseworthy uh, expression of this view that religious views of politicians should be private was expressed by John F. Kennedy when, uh, it, when the fact that he was Catholic was a controversial issue and he felt it necessary to say that his Catholic beliefs uh, would not influence his policy, and of course they didn't. I want to express scepticism about whether a man as intelligent and well-educated as John F. Kennedy really did believe that a wafer turned into the body of Jesus and the wine turned into the blood. When 
I say that that belief in transubstantiation is ridiculous? I am not saying that I think John F. Kennedy was, was ridiculous. I don't think he believed that for one moment. What I am saying is that maybe we shouldn't be quite so reticent about asking people when they say they're Catholic, or when they say they're Mormon, or when they say they're whatever it is, Pentecostalist or whatever, don't just say, ah, yes, all right, that's private, we won't ask any more questions. Say, oh, you're Catholic, are you? Do you really believe that a wafer turns into a bobby to Jesus? And my guess is that they'll say, oh, no, of course I don't. But that's what we want to get them to say. We want to get them to admit that actually, although they call themselves Catholic or whatever it is, they really are not Catholic. Because if you commit yourself to being Catholic, then you are committing yourself to a whole lot of beliefs which uh, need to be at the very least defended. So I think the doctrine that religious belief should be regarded as private, off-limits, off-the-table, should be challenged. And I'm asking people, don't go along with this convention that we don't, it's not, somehow not polite to talk about somebody's religious beliefs. Because religious beliefs are immensely important. Not only do they influence people's moral judgments, as we've seen, but they also constitute a worldview, a view of the universe, a view of the, a view of the, of the world, which is a relevant and important part of that person's identity. And so I'm asking you, do we really want to leave that as, as a private matter, never to, be, uh, never to be questioned? This matter arose in Britain recently when the British branch of the Richard Dawkins Foundation conducted an opinion poll. And we did this because uh, Britain, as you know, does not have a constitution separation between church and state. Uh, the Church of England is an integral part of the governance of Britain. The Queen is the head of the Church of England. There are 26 bishops who sit in Parliament as of right because they are bishops. Uh, you have to go as far as Saudi Arabia, I think, to find another place, or Iran, to find another place where clerics automatically sit in Parliament because of their, uh, because they are clerics. In Britain, we have a census every 10 years, and in the 2001 census, 72% uh, of the population ticked the box labelled Christian. That fact has been used in the 10 years since then by politicians and by prelates and preachers and bishops to justify Christian policies in Britain. Britain is a Christian country, 72% tick the Christian box in the census. So when the 2011 census came along, we suspected that the same thing would happen. Tried to run a campaign to have the religion question removed from the census, but it wasn't. So we fell back on plan B, which was to commission an opinion poll by Ipsos Mori, which is a very respected and respectable polling organization, to question those people who ticked the Christian box in the very week after the 2011 census to find out what they really believe. And this is what I'm encouraging you to do in this country. When you meet somebody who says they're Catholic or Muslim, whatever it is, ask them what they really believe. We asked the people who ticked the Christian box in the census what they really believe. The first interesting fact is that that figure of 72% seems to have dropped in the 10 years since 2001, to 54%. That was, only, that was only the first step in our investigation. We wanted to then take that 54%, the people who ticked the Christian box, and ask supplementary questions to say, what does it mean to be Christian? Are you really Christian? Do you really do go to church? Do you read the Bible? Do you believe Jesus is the Son of God? Um, why did you tick the Christian box? And the 54% then drops dramatically to a much smaller percentage when you measure any of those indices of, of whether these people really are uh, Christian. Perhaps the most um, amusing of those results is when we ask them, what is the first book of the New Testament? 
and they didn't even have to remember that it was Matthew. All they had to do was tick, was choose a multiple choice of four. We gave them Matthew, Genesis, Acts of the Apostles, and Psalms. Only 35%, not of the British people, only 35% of the 54 who ticked the Christian box could identify Matthew as the first book of the New Testament. Now, of course, it's not important what's the first book of the New Testament, but it does at least suggest a certain disconnect from the Christian culture which they, which they postulate. And the same goes for the answers to all the various other questions that we, that we asked. We specifically asked them, why did you tick the Christian box? And we offered them things like, because I believe Jesus is my Lord and Saviour, because I believe in the teachings of Jesus and so on. But the most popular answer to that question was, oh well I like to think of myself as a good person. <laughs> That's a reason for ticking the Christian box. <laughs> so that if politicians want to say 54%, it's only 54 now, 54% of the British people are Christian, the majority of people who ticked the Christian box did so thinking that because they try to be a good person, that means they ought to tick the Christian box. But it gets worse, or better, depending on you look at it. We also asked them, when you are faced with a moral dilemma, when you are faced with a question of right and wrong, to what do you turn? Do you turn to your religion? in order to decide the answer to a moral dilemma. Only 10% of the 54% said they turned to their religion when faced with a moral dilemma. The most popular answer to that question is one that I think many of us might share. Uh, they turned to their innate moral sense of what is right and wrong. And the next most popular answer was, I turn to advice from friends and relations. So, after our opinion poll, it will no longer be possible for politicians in Britain to claim that Britain is a Christian country and therefore to uh, promote Christian policies and Christian values. Now, we've been accused of trying to dictate to people who want to call themselves Christian whether they should be allowed to call themselves Christian. That's not the point. They can call themselves whatever they like. The point is that they should not be hijacked by bishops, by prelates, by politicians who want to use their numbers as evidence that Britain is a Christian country and therefore that Christian policies on, for example, abortion, uh, the right to die, uh, and that kind of uh, stem cell research and things like, like that should be, um, they should not be allowed to hijack the percentage figure that comes out of the uh, census. Well, that was, that was Britain. And I, I, I want to, to leave you with the thought that the same is probably true of this country as well. And do not let the Christians, the Muslims, the religious people of, what, of whatever stamp hijack the great majority, as I believe it to be, of people in this country who may vaguely say they're Christian because they were baptized or whatever it might be, or because they like to think of themselves as a good person. We mustn't let them hijack those people. And perhaps one of the ways to make sure that doesn't happen is to don't accept what somebody tells you when they say they're Christian. Ask the supplementary question. You mean you believe Jesus is your Lord and Savior? Oh, well, no, I, I didn't really mean that. I just meant um, I just meant I like to be a good person, or I was, well, I was baptized, or something like that. I suspect that there's an enormous number of people who are sort of advertised on the surface as though they were Christian, but actually are not. And above all, I suspect that that may apply, in fact, I'm absolutely sure it applies, to uh, your elected representatives. There are 535 members of the United States Congress. It is statistically inconceivable that 534 of them are devout religious believers. <laughs> Congressman Pete Stark is not alone.
statistically almost obvious that there must be probably hundreds like him who don't dare come out and say so. They are lying to their constituents because they believe they've been led to believe that it's necessary to lie about their innermost convictions in order to get elected. And so I would encourage people to challenge that, to challenge your congressperson, your senators, and say, do you really believe what you pretend to believe? Or are you possibly misled into thinking that you have to do that in order to win votes. So probably what we need to do, what you need to do, I'm not a citizen of this country, what you need to do is to work on getting the message across to politicians and everybody else that we, the people who sit in this room, are far, far more numerous than anybody realizes. You are a constituency, a voting constituency, a lobbying, a lobbying constituency, far more powerful than many people in this country believe, and maybe more powerful than even you believe. Thank you very much.